Twelve Byzantine Rulers by Lars Brownworth Episode 5 Julian Welcome back. We ended the last lecture with the death of Constantine, one of the driving personalities of history. And as with any larger-than-life figure, his death left a certain amount of chaos in its wake. The man who eventually came to succeed him, though radically different, would catch the imagination of succeeding generations as no other Byzantine emperor. To medieval authors, he was the Antichrist. To the Renaissance, he was a tragic hero. To the 18th century, he was the archetypal philosopher prince, the apostle of reason and enlightenment. And to the Romantics, he was the ultimate outsider and rebel, noble, courageous, but in the end defeated. Each has a grain of truth, but fails to capture the whole picture. Julian the Apostate was a complex, enigmatic figure, and he demonstrates the danger of oversimplifying the past. Looking hard enough, whether for a hero or a devil, each generation was able to see what it wanted to see. The truth is, few people living at the time of Constantine's death would have found anything great in Julian. Indeed, the mere fact that he survived his childhood is miracle enough. At the tender age of five, his three cousins became the rulers of the Roman Empire, the army had announced that they would only accept a joint rule by Constantine's three surviving sons, and to ensure that no one else would claim the throne, Constantius, the middle son, started a rumor accusing his half-uncles, Julian's father, of poisoning Constantine. The army responded in horrific fashion by lynching every male relative of the former emperor. Constantine's half-brother, Julius Constantius, was pursued to his house and butchered on the spot with his eldest son. His youngest sons, Julian and Gallus, were only spared because of their age. No sooner did the three brothers have complete control than they started to fight amongst themselves. Constantine the Great had shown his typical arrogance and lack of imagination in naming his children. His daughter was Constantia, and his three surviving sons were Constantine the Second, Constantius, and Constans. Constantine the Second, as the eldest son, naturally tried at every opportunity to lord it over his brothers, and only two years after becoming emperor, he picked on his youngest brother, Constans, and invaded Italy. Unfortunately, he underestimated him and was ambushed and killed. Constans, finally secure on his throne, found it much more fun to devote his time to his blonde female prisoners than to administer the state or take care of the army. The army was soon on the brink of revolt, and while Constans was away hunting, a usurper by the name of Magentius donned the purple. Constans fled, was captured, and killed. The next year, the last brother, Constantius, defeated Magentius and raised Julian's brother Gallus to be Caesar. Leaving him to administer the east, Constantius spent the next three years pacifying the west. Transported from a prison to the throne, Gallus was simply unfit to reign. He spent most of his time indulging a rather cruel streak until Constantius, mistrusting him and fearing revolt, had him assassinated. The situation in Gaul was now a serious problem, but more importantly, the Persian War initiated by Constantine still had to be fought. Realizing that he had to appoint someone to take care of the West while he, was to, while he took care of the more important East, he tapped the last remaining member of his family, Julian. He was a shy, awkward philosopher and scholar, and had no military or administrative experience, but he was intelligent, loyal, and a hard worker. So at 23, the young, unknown, and unwilling Flavius Claudius Julianus became Caesar. Since that horrible night of blood when his family had been killed, Julian had been packed off to Nicomedia to obtain a Christian education under the bishop Eusebius, and then on to western Turkey near modern-day Cappadocia. He remained here for six years with only books as company, obtaining permission to devote himself to serious study. The next six years were, in his own words, the happiest in his life. What better way for a budding philosopher to spend his time than wandering around the Greek world, sitting at the feet of the greatest thinkers and scholars of the day, reading, arguing, discussing, and disputing? It was here that he first heard Libanius, a celebrated philosopher who had rejected Christianity and remained unabashedly pagan. Julian's interest worried his Christian teachers, and when one of them forbid him from attending the lectures, he simply had them copied down and read to him. On his way to Athens, he stopped at the great library at Ephesus, 
and at this point seems to have made the decision to abandon Christianity and adopt paganism. Now, this was not the sort of thing you could just announce, so he kept up an outward show of Christian piety, and it would be another ten years till he would be able to announce it openly. He reached Athens in the summer of his twenty-third year, an awkward, painfully shy man with no friends of his own age, completely without imperial pretensions, and wanting only to be left alone to continue his studies, it was at this point that Constantius called him to Milan and appointed him co-ruler of the Roman Empire. It must have been quite a meeting. They had only met as adults once before, seven or eight years previously, and then only briefly. Now they stood face to face as full-grown men, Constantius trying to run an empire, and Julian masking his hatred of his father's killer and wanting only to be left alone to study. But it was not to be. Hastily sent to Gaul, with, as a chronicler later said, no more authority than to wear the uniform, the ungainly bookworm was immediately faced with open revolt, but he learned fast. Personally leading a whirlwind campaign that summer, he recaptured a number of important cities and smashed an army of 30,000 with only 11,000 soldiers of his own, incurring only 247 casualties along the way. The next two years brought more victories, and within four years the entire frontier was settled. Back in the east, Constantius received his cousin's surprising success with rather mixed emotions. The empire was more stable, but a colleague's success was always something to be watched. Worse, since his father's reign, the Persians had been raiding Roman territory with increasing frequency, and full-blown war could no longer be avoided. The new Persian king Shapur, who has the distinction of being perhaps the only king crowned in utero, had written Constantius in the florid language only an eastern potentate could use. Shapur, king of kings, brother of the sun and moon, sends salutation. Because I take delight in moderation, I shall be content to receive Mesopotamia and Armenia from you. I give you warning that if my ambassador returns empty-handed, I shall take the field against you with all my armies as soon as the winter is past. Shapur followed this up by overrunning several Roman strongholds and pillaging the food supply. In the face of such a massive invasion, Constantius had no choice but to prepare his army, and now that the West was pacified, he quite naturally sent word to Julian to provide him with troops. Julian was now faced with a very serious test. Given what had happened to the rest of his family, he was rightfully so mistrustful of Constantius, but far more seriously, he had promised his troops that he would never take them east. Few of them would likely return from such a mission, and worse, their families and lands would be defenseless against barbarian incursions. Reluctantly, he made his way east, stopping in Paris to rest. The army, led by the appropriately named Petulantes Legion, mutinied and declared him emperor. This was not quite a rebellion, since he didn't claim the whole empire, but it signaled that he would no longer take orders from the east. Not wanting to spark a devastating civil war, Julian asked his cousin to recognize his title, claiming that he had never wanted it and his men had forced it upon him. Constantius, for his part, had no intention of recognizing him as anything more than Caesar, and after negotiations came to nothing, Julian began to march east to confront him. Constantius, fearing the worst, interrupted his campaign in Mesopotamia and marched against his cousin. He commanded much larger forces and had showed himself a capable and determined commander and appeared to have all the advantages. He reached Cilicia in a confident mood, but after he saw a headless corpse, which he took as a bad omen, he fell mortally ill. As he was baptized on his deathbed, not knowing of his cousin's apostasy, he magnanimously named Julian his successor. He was only 44 years old. Rushing to Constantinople, Julian ordered the city into deep mourning. He personally supervised the unloading of the coffin at the quay, followed it through the streets to the Church of the Holy Apostles, weeping as the body of his father's murderer was laid to rest. Only after it was over did he accept the mantle of emperor, and he never entered a Christian church again. He immediately set about reforming the empire, trying to decentralize power and restore the old republican virtues. First on the chopping block was the emperor's personal staff. It had gotten completely out of control, especially in the eyes of a single man uninterested in luxury. 
he fired thousands of cooks, chamberlains, and household servants without compensation, retaining only a skeleton staff. He then tried to increase the power of the Senate, slimming down its numbers and appearing at its meetings on foot as a sign of respect. He streamlined the system of taxation, a notoriously corrupt industry, and held military tribunals to try the worst offenders, including the sinisterly named Paul the Chain. But his main goal, upon which he spent most of his time, was to restore paganism and eliminate Christianity. There would be no need for persecution, since martyrs always tended to have the opposite effect anyway, and tended to strengthen resolve. Instead, he opened pagan temples and cleverly declared an amnesty for all those Orthodox Christian churchmen whom the pro-Aryan government of Constantius had sent into exile. They would soon, he thought, be at each other's throats. No wild beasts, he said, are so hostile to men as our Christian sects in general to one another. They would soon, he hoped, see the error of their ways and come back to the pagan faith they never should have left. This may seem a bit naive, but Julian was a strange combination. Roman emperor, Greek philosopher, and mystic. He knew that his empire was sick. The army, no longer a feared invincible force, could now barely keep peace on the frontier. The government was inefficient and corrupt, and the emperors were soft, hedonistic men who spent most of their time reclining in their palaces in pursuit of pleasure. The old Roman virtues of reason, duty, honor, and integrity were gone. The problem, he thought, was the moral decay of Christianity. It went against all the noble virtues, emphasizing instead such feminine qualities as gentleness, meekness, forgiveness, and turning the other cheek. It had, in effect, robbed the empire of its manliness. He crisscrossed his empire making sacrifices, trying to jumpstart paganism. He made so many, in fact, that his amused subjects gave him the nickname The Butcher, but all to no avail. The old religion seemed in no great hurry to recover. Something more was needed. The Persian problem still had to be addressed, and a victory would perhaps reinvigorate paganism and vindicate it. After a few months spent at Constantinople to enact more reforms, he went to Antioch to prepare the invasion. Relations with the Christians were bad from the start. Most of the citizens of Antioch were Christians who were used to Constantius's splendid court and found little to like in their new, austere, moralizing emperor. Worse still, since paganism had been slow to recover, he had decided to turn up the pressure on the Christians, executing those who damaged temples, pardoning pagans who murdered Christians, and prohibiting Christians from teaching the Greek classics. With a stunning disregard of public opinion, he then embarked on an escalating series of attacks, almost daring his subjects to revolt. Knowing that Christ had prophesied that the Jewish temple at Jerusalem would not be rebuilt till the end times, he tried to refute it by starting a rebuilding program, only to have an earthquake destroy the attempt. Then, realizing that his brother Gallus had buried a Christian martyr in the precinct of the Temple of Apollo, he had the body exhumed. When massive riots broke out, he had the demonstrators arrested and even tortured, and when the entire complex burned a few months later, he blamed it on the Christians and closed the city's cathedral, after first confiscating all their gold plate. At this point, he was even losing the support of the pagans, with the city on the brink of revolt, and it was probably to mutual relief when, following in the footsteps of Pompey and Hadrian, and probably believing that he was the reincarnation of Alexander the Great, he left in March 363, never to return. Shapur II certainly was taken back by the size of the Roman force, and just tried to stay out of the way of Julian's large army, settling instead on harassing attacks. Julian's plan was to threaten the Persian capital of Testaphon and then impose harsh terms, and to do this he split his army and headed for the capital. When he arrived, he found that the other half of his army had failed to materialize. To make matters worse, in between himself and the city, a huge Persian army was drawn up, complete with dreaded elephants whose smell terrified horses. He immediately gave the order to charge, and to the surprise apparently of both sides, he gained an overwhelming victory. One eyewitness tells us that 2,500 Persians were killed at a cost of only 70 Romans. The next day, however, the situation had changed drastically. Testaphon was virtually impregnable, and Shapur's main army, far larger than the one he had just defeated, was approaching rapidly. They were also running short of supplies, and in their exposed position were easy prey of the brutal summer sun. 
With morale sinking, he abandoned the siege, recrossed the Tigris, and proposed to his generals to strike further into Persian territory. They flatly refused, knowing full well that even had they agreed, their men would never have followed. The full retreat began, constantly harassed by Persians and plagued by the heat and flies whose swarms blotted out the sun. Ten days later, when crossing a stream, the army suddenly came under heavy attack. Without stopping to strap on his armor, Julian leapt into battle, shouting encouragement and fighting where it was thickest. Just as the tide turned, Julian was struck in the side with a spear. Falling off his horse, he tried to pull the point out, but succeeded only in cutting his fingers to the bone. His men rushed up to him, and the point was removed from deep inside his liver. He was carried back to his tent, where he died at midnight, according to legend with the words, Thou hast conquered, Galilean. With his death, an age had ended. No pagan emperor would ever sit on a Roman throne again, and in a final rejection of his policies, the army elected a Christian, the deeply uninspiring Jovian, to replace him. Julian's story is a tragedy of possibilities, not in his early death, but what could have been. Few have had his courage and leadership, his incorruptibility and his integrity, or his single-minded dedication to his ideals. With skills like these, he could have changed the world, and had he lived, he may have become one of the greatest Roman emperors. But instead, he wasted them on a foolish attempt to revive a moribund religion at the expense of one which would define his empire for a millennium to come. In the end, the last member of Constantine's family died as he had lived bravely but unnecessarily, his talents betrayed and his promise unfulfilled.